Okay, I want you to find several places in your Bible, if you would, just get you an index. Find 1 John, that's the little one in the back of your Bible, over there behind, right behind Revelations, cut back a few pages, and uh, you'll come to 1 John. First John chapter 4, and you can find the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. Get both of them to have folded pages. Page fold. The Gospel of John chapter 10. John 10. John 10. Yep, yeah, find John 10. And find uh, 1 John chapter 4. The more study and the more research I do, which is, I'm addicted to it, so I do it often, quite a bit, every day. <laughs> uh, the, the more profound this book becomes for me. And uh, I don't see it through the glasses that I started out seeing 45, 50 years ago. I don't see it that way at all. I see it as the most profound storybook that's ever been given to mankind. And when I say that, I have learned to appreciate other stories, like the story, children's stories. And many children are shaped and fashioned and hold children's stories in them all the time. I mean, you know, like all women look for a big prince to come. I mean, it's just a normal, natural thing. And uh, so those little stories give people hope. And uh, we, we fail to see the fact that scriptures are stories. And you can, you can say, oh, yeah, brother, man, we know they're stories. But they're not meant to be taken as a literal story. They're meant to be taken as a mystical story. A story that contains great mysteries. And if you see it that way, then you can begin to stretch your mind, open your mind, so that you can go into it and see it differently. And if we can't, if we don't do that, if it's just an ancient story that's told historically about somebody that did something back then, then it makes it null and void to be alive for you and me today. To be something that's, that's present, that's in the now. And so, you know, I've, you know, I've had people to ask me, and some won't even argue with me about the literalness of Jesus. I said, I think you missed the whole point. I think all of Christianity misses the whole point. It's not a literal story; it's a mythical story or a mystery story. That's the most fabulous story we've ever had. And we go to looking at it that way, and just paying attention to what it says. It says things that, if I repeat those things automatically in Christianity I would be called a cult leader mm -hmm. and so that's how people would would view me as a cult leader so y'all would be a part of a cult mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, all in the world in, in there again <laughs> if people would uh, if they would just research and and look up the definition of words uh, I wrote these down right here uh, because I used to, when I first started, I, I bought Dr. Walter Martin's big, thick book, probably 600 pages, called The Kingdom of the Cult. And in that book, he's tearing down just about any and everything that I would preach and teach by calling it a cult. And most people, if you think it's a cult, then what's one of the first things you think of? Same. Uh, what? Satan. Evil. Fate. Yeah. You see, you know, I said D most time when people think of a cult, they think it's Satan. Satan. Okay. Yeah. Evil. Is what y'all said? Yeah. Evil. Cult. You see. You know, it's amazing. Evil. Evil. Here it is. I, I'm just going to read it to you. And you can look this up. You can Google it on the phone if you like. A cult is a system of religious worship. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah. So a Baptist church is a cult. Why? Because they have a system of beliefs of worship. Catholic system of beliefs of worship. All of those are cults. But yet, 
if you if you teach the truth and people call you a cult, then it puts you in a satanic area, they think. That's how they think. So here's what a, a cult is. A system of religious beliefs, the practice of the beliefs of a group or a sect, which which we get our word. Here's where we get this word. Listen to this word. Culture. You start putting it that way. Oh, it's a culture. Well, what, what do you think of when you hear the word culture? Oh, it's it's a same. way of life. Exactly. A way of living. It's a culture. So, they're, they're not bad. But yeah, when I read Dr. Walter Martin's book, I mean, he made it into, into a demonic hornet's nest. And he called all these, and he, then he called all these religious groups that he thought were cults. But then, here's another word that's so mislead, misunderstood. It's occult. So we always lump the two in the same category. Occult and cult. But an occult is beyond boundaries of ordinary knowledge. If it's an occult, that means it's secret. The entire Bible is an occult book. Why? Because it's a book of secrets, of mysteries. And the only way that you will see or understand those secrets or those deep mysteries is you have to be initiated into a place where they teach the unveiling of those mysteries. So you won't get it going to church. <laughs> you only get it by being initiated. The only thing the initiation just simply means that you have taken a you have taken a step in the right direction to open your mind and open your understanding to listen to things outside your boundaries. So an old call is beyond the boundaries of your ordinary knowledge. It takes you into the arena of revelation knowledge. That's all the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Ezekiel. That's all they are about is revelation knowledge. Knowledge that you cannot assimilate by yourself. You have to tap into a vein of the Spirit to, to get that knowledge. So, so anyway, people, we all get duped by religious beliefs and you know, I, I, I'm at the point I don't have any breath or wind to fight any on, over any argument when people say, well, do you believe in a literal Jesus? And I had that asked to me yesterday by a man that I love and appreciate, and he loves me and appreciates me. He's always thought I was really strange and different. And he said, you still teaching that cult stuff? I said, yeah, more than ever. I said, it's, it's better than it's ever been and, and just getting, getting better all the time. And I said, you know, if I can just have if I could just have your ear for 15 minutes and let me just really speak to you without you blocking it all off, if you could just listen, I will open your eyes and make you see something. You'll see it, I promise you. So this is what I'm going to do here with this, and I want you to look at this with me, because again, I believe as much, if not stronger, than anybody in the Jesus story. It is the most profound story. My problem is, most people don't know it. They call themselves Christians and don't even know. They call themselves born-again believers. They call themselves saved. All the terminologies they use and don't even know what the story is about. I mean, it's just a sad, it's a sad scenario, but it's the, way, it's the way things are. So if you found 1 John chapter 4, I want you to look at this with me. Verse 16, it says, And we have known and believed, Actually, it should be trusted. We have known and trusted the love of God that God hath to us. God is love. Everybody, let's say that. Say, God, God is love. Is God is love. Well, if you want to know what God is, God is love. Whatever, ever, how you would define that. that, that there's several things that's sad to say in, in Greek that would be translated for the word love. Phileo is a word translated for love. Agape is a word translated for love. But in English, all we have is the word love. And so if I tell you I love fried chicken, I'm not having, I'm not having a relationship with it. Uh, you want know, to If I tell you I love my wife, I'm having a relationship with her. You see what I'm saying? But we use that one word love. So if you say, well, I love my truck, I love my car, I love my Mini Cooper. <laughs> Are you having a relationship with it? Because that's how we associate that word, love. 
Oh, well, you know, I love apple pie. Hallelujah. Yum, yum, yum. See, in Greek, they have different words mm -hmm. to help to understand what, what you say when you say these words. We don't have that in English. And because of the limitations we have in the English language, a lot of this book that's written in Greek and in Hebrew, you ain't going to catch what it means when it says that. That's the word agape. God is agape. You know what agape is? It's unconditional love. It's love that loves, period. It loves you no matter what you do or what you don't do. It hasn't got anything to do with performance. Has nothing to do with your performance. Has nothing to do with what you do, do. Right or wrong. It just simply says, there's not anything you can do to separate you from my love. And that's how God is. God is love. So, we're talking about God, right? God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwells in God. And God is where? God's where? He's where? He's in him. So where's God at? Everybody yeah. say it's in me. Yeah. See, if y'all would take him off that throne way out yonder somewhere in your mm -hmm. ethereal mind that religion gave you and bring God down and put him on the throne of your heart and realize this is the position where God is at. And I can learn to live out of that position it's where God can instruct me, teach me, lead me, mm -hmm. guide me yes. so that I love as God loves. When I do that, I gotta fall in love with the people I don't like. <laughs> All the politicians I like to go up there and take it, take them out of what you had. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> Preach it, brother. Preach it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of balance. They use the word judgment. If I draw the astrological wheel and I put it over here on Libra. And I show you that Libra is not referring to a judge sitting on a throne saying, I got you. I wrote it down. You know, the whole idea in Christianity that God's got a book right now, all the stuff that you have done, all the stuff that you are doing, and He's got you caught red-handed, and then He's going to unveil that book one of these days, and you're going to stand before Him and say, Oh my God, I didn't know you saw that. <laughs> How could He not see it? He's in you everywhere you go and everything you do. That's right. Oh, I mean, there you are. You're stuck. So if you understand Libra, Libra never should have been called the scales of judgment. It should have been called the scales of balance because it's balancing everything. It's not what you do so much as an extreme left or what you do so much as an extreme right. It's learning to walk in the middle way. That's right. All religions is about that. Walk, learn to walk in the middle way. When you learn to walk in the middle way, you're walking by the single eye Jesus said it in Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. He said, your eye should be single. Well, what, have I got to poke up one eye out? No, be like Horace when he gouged his eye out? No, God is, God is not saying that at all. God is saying we've got to come back to taking both the left and the right eyeball and balance them with the single eye of the pineal gland, the eye of God. Because you have it, everybody's got it. Many times our pineal gland gets calcified because we drink stuff that, that does that to it, calcified. And we can, you know, we can fast, <coughs> and we can do certain things and clear out the, uh, the calcification of the pineal gland. But, so, let me read verse 17 again. Here is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of balance because as he is, as he who? As he who is? God. God, absolutely. That's who we're talking about. It should be clear there. Verse, verse 16, it says that we have not the love of God. God, that He is that God loves us. God in us. God is who He's talking about. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of balance because as God is. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How do you think God is? Is God complete? Yes. Is God perfect? Yes. Is God whole? Yes. Is God love? Yes. Is God light? Yes. Well, that ever how God is, that's how you is. <laughs> huh? That's I didn't say it. I mean, I said it a little different, but it says the same thing. As God is, so are we. So ever how God is, however how you see God, then uh, you know if you see God as a mean old man, and I imagine probably you could be a mean old man. Or a mean old woman. 
You could be, if that's how you see God. Because every how you see God, then that's how you're going to be. So we need to pay attention as to how we do see God. If we see God as love, if we see God as light, if we see God as all of these other things, listen to this, watch this, it goes even further. Verse, 7, verse 18, there is no, what's the word? Fear. In love. Where do you get fear from? Fear always comes from without to try to come in. So when you go to a church and they preach in hellfire and condemnation, they're trying to beat you up, trying to make you feel ashamed, trying to make you feel blamed, trying to put you down. What are they trying to do? Put you in the mode of fear. Why? Because you're afraid you're going to burn in an eternal fire forever and ever and ever. Connie's grandmother, bless her heart, grew up in Baptist church. She's 92 years old. And I was in her room at the hospital right over here at Hamilton Memorial. And she was dying. And, and here's what she was laying in the bed dying. She said, oh my God, my feet are burning. I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm in hell. I heard those words come out of her mouth. You know why? She had been tormented all of her life through these preachers and teachers that told her she would burn in hell forever and ever. Most damnable thing you could do, you talk about messing up the psychology. You take this, and they hammer this kind of crap into little children. I'm talking about when they're two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Take them to Sunday school and put them in that kind of an environment so that they get indoctrinated with the doctrine of fear. You better be afraid of God. That's crazy. Look at this. I, I look at it. I mean, you can't get it any clearer than me. I don't understand how people can. Verse 18, there is no fear in love. And we just got through saying God is love, so God doesn't have fear and God doesn't give off fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Mm -hmm. See, if you take that, the God of love in your heart, you get rid of the fear. You get rid of all of those things that terrify you. Fear of death. Fear of, of, of hurt, harm. Uh, fear of abuse. All kinds of things that happen and take place. And that's what God wants us to do. That, to walk as God walked. As He is, that's how I am. So, if I, were to, if I were to do just exactly what Jesus said that I could do, what He said that, that uh, they got mad at Him for saying that He did, look at this with me in John 10.10. 10. John chapter 10. Let's back up to verse 6. Everybody still in the boat? Hang on. No, everybody dropped that out of there. Oh, we're hanging. Everybody bailed up. Oh, Lord. Okay. John chapter 10, verse 6. It says, And this parable, I've told you, uh, the word parable actually means a story. It's not referring to anything that's, that's literal or historical. It's just a fabulous story that has great content in it. So, this is what he's saying. And most of them never understood the parables. It's, here we've been 2,000 years and still shaking our head trying to figure them out. So they're not complicated. They're simple. But they are spiritual. Using natural illustrations to convey spiritual truth. And that's probably the conundrum of it. Because when we take a natural illustration, then we want to keep it hung in the natural, not allow it to come over into the spirit. The spiritual is unseen. You don't see the Spirit. The Spirit's filled. This room's filled with the Spirit right now. You don't see it. Sometimes you can feel or sense or even smell the effect of it. Okay. This, verse 6. This parable spake Jesus unto them, and they, what? They didn't understand. They didn't understand. They didn't understand. See that? I mean, and it, this is a, this all through the Scripture it says it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the time. Proverbs. When they talk about parables, Proverbs, they're talking about sayings. They're talking about mysteries. They're talking about things that have deep content to them. And, it, it, and what's, what's happening in this place, and it's always happened here, is deep is crying unto the deep. The deep and the depth of God is crying unto the deep and the depth of God in you. So that the depth of God that's in you will raise up out of you and become bold as a lion. Strong, vigorous, to be what God made you out to be. To be what God called you to be. So, why, why is it that way? Because there's no fear in it. 
there's not anything to fear. You don't have to fear things. You'll say, well, well I'm, I'm sick as a dog. Well, <laughs> then get well as a dog. <laughs> right? Okay, verse, verse 7. And then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say, I'm the door of the sheep, and all that ever come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, uh, he shall be saved. He, he shall be saved. Verse 10, it says, The thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come. I am. Everybody let's say, I am. I am. You know, we've been talking about that for the last several weeks. I am. What is I am? Who is I am? Two little simple words that are most powerful words put together in, in, in anywhere. When you say, I am sick, most likely you're going to be sick. When you say, I am broke, most likely you're going to be broke. Why? Because you preference that with two of the most powerful words ever been used. I am. So if you want to say, I am well, I am overcoming, I am being healed, that's a whole, whole lot more in the right direction, a whole lot better than trying to yield to all the things that your body's trying to say, no, you're this way, you're this way. So, verse 10, the thief comes not but for keep steal, to kill, to destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it how? More abundant. More abundant. More abundant. If you talk down to verse 30. This is where it really gets tough. Just really pay attention and open your eyes, open your ears, and see it. It gets harder right here. Jesus said in verse 30, I and my Father are one. Now, would you not say that Jesus was referring to God as the Father? Yes. Absolutely. So what was Jesus saying? Me and the Father are me and God are one. Then would that make you as God is? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, that would, if you feel more, uh, more better, <laughs> if you feel more better, that's the same thing if you feel comfortable. You said it Southern, a little bit different. If you feel comfortable, put a small G on it and say, I am God. It don't matter if you put a little or a big on it. <laughs> it don't matter the size of the G, you're God. You're as God is. And you know what that would make me? That would qualify me as a cult in religious ideology. They say, you're a cult leader. Here you are. Look at what goes on with this with Jesus. Verse 31. Then the Jews took a stone and they're going to kill him. Look at it. They got mad. Verse 32. And Jesus answered, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those do you stone me? And the Jews answered, saying, we, For a good work we stone you not, but for blasphemy. Because thou being a man. Look here. In this story, Jesus is associating himself like you are. Not special. Mm -mm. Nothing different. He's associating himself as just as carnal as you ever be. He's associating himself with humanity. Mm -hmm. Us. Yes. He said, but not, he said, the Jews said, not for good works, but for this, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, what in the world is wrong with that? Why would people want to get mad and kill you when you do that? Because it tells you very clearly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God made you after God's own likeness. Look at it in Hebrew, it said God made you as its likeness. In other words, you are the manifestation of what the pattern, the plan of God was to manifest itself in the earth, and He manifested it in you and wants to manifest it through you. That's the plan from the beginning. Genesis 1, 26, God said, I made you to be like me. Well, how are you going to be like God? You're going to have to practice God-likeness. So they said, no, we're not going to stone you because of that, because you're just a human being and you're calling yourself God. Then verse 34 is a, is a kicker right here. And Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are God's? That's actually <coughs> quoted in Psalms 82.6. You can write it down if you'd like to go over there sometime and look at it, and it will show you uh, that say that exact same thing. And the only difference is in Psalms, it does use a small g, 
which a lot of theologians and preachers will try to translate that to say it was just referring to a judge or referring to uh, uh, not Elohim, but it is the Hebrew word Elohim because there are no lower, lower or uppercase uh, glyphs in the Hebrew. They're all like that. No matter how big you write or how little you write it, it ain't going to change. It doesn't, it doesn't change. So, go with me to Genesis chapter 50. Now, we're going to go back and we're going to pick up some things on this story. Uh, you know, like we talked about the story of Jesus last week with the women at the Samaritan women at the well. We're going to pick up on that because we found Moses doing exactly the same thing in Exodus where he was at the well getting water and then these these women come down there and have like seven of them come down there. It's amazing and you'll find these stories I tell you, you'll find these stories well we do out and in them, even though the story might be told with different characters, story is pretty much telling the same thing. It's always kind of telling the same story but may have different as, uh, aspects or facets of that story with the different characters that's in it. So that's the story. And we're looking at the story of Moses because Moses is one of the characters in the Old Testament that symbolizes you, as Jesus symbolizes you, as Joseph symbolizes you, as Joshua symbolizes you, as David symbolizes you, <laughs> and on and on and on and on and on. They're all stories that have symbols of you and what you do, your ups and downs, your ins, your outs, your good days, your bad days. Y'all ever have anything? No, oh, yeah. <laughs> they get to come. Yeah, they do get to come. So look at this with me, and uh, this is this is uh, the end of Genesis. Genesis most of, most uh, of the book of Genesis is all written in the Hebrew coded alphabet. So it's uh, it's written strictly in glyphs, and has no punctuations. It has no vowel points in it when you look at the original Torah. They add those punctuations and vowel points to give these phenomenal words uh, a name. And some of them, many of them weren't even meant to be a name. They were just meant to be a formula of energy. So, uh, right here, we want to come to this place in Genesis chapter 50, verse 22. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. So he saw his third generation of his grandkids. That's pretty good. I think it's pretty good. I'd like to see the third generation of my grandkids. That means that my little poppy right now, she's uh, four months old, six months old. Looks like she's a year old. She's growing like a week. <laughs> that means she's going to have to grow up 22, 25, 30. And have me a great, great... Great grandmother. What did he fall? That's not. So, looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. So, Joseph grew up in Egypt, and he's, uh, he's still out with the child. You remember Joseph? He's, uh, he represents a portion of the astrological wheel. He would represent the portion of Aquarius. And then his brother Benjamin would represent the portion of uh, Pisces, the fishes. So all of all of the twelve sons of Jacob represented one of the of the angles of the astrological wheel because there are twelve angles in the astrological wheel, and the twelve sons represented those twelve angles. And it tells you that. As a matter of fact, it tells you that here in Genesis 30, 37, chapter thirty seven, chapter thirty. It tells you that. We'll look at that just so that you know that I'm not trying to make that up and snow you. Uh, so verse twenty two it says, and Joseph dwelt in in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up under Joseph's knees. That would be good. I'd love to do that. I'd like to bring my grandkids up on my knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which, which he swore to Abraham. Now, one of the key figures in the Old Testament Scripture is Abraham. It's not necessarily Adam. It's Abraham. It's the key figure. Matter of fact, 
Paul even uses Abraham as the key figure of our father. Because Ab Paul even goes out so boldly and says, Abraham is all of our father. So he's comparing Abraham to God as the father. You hear what I'm saying? So, so even though, and, you, and you've been taught to think that Abraham, he was the progenitor of the Jews, which is the tribe of Judah, which is only one-twelfth of the angles of the astrological week, which was a gross error for anybody to ever do that and to tell us that and try to get us to believe that. So that now then we look at the entire tribe that come out of the loins of Abraham being the first Hebrew. That's the Hebrew word for Hebrew. And the word Hebrew just simply means to be called out and up. And all it was referring to is you knowing how to call God out and up that's inside you. That's what a Hebrew is. It's not the color of your skin, not the texture of your hair. It's every human being that's alive on the face of this earth are a Hebrew. We have such gross confusion about that, mainly because of Christianity and what's going on over in Israel right now. Should never, ever have been. Because what we would call a war over there between two nations, Palestine and Jerusalem, should never, ever be. What they did is they took all of these fabulous stories, made them literal. That's where they get all this stuff. And they were never meant to be literal. They were meant to be typologies of a, phenom a phenomenal story that is the mystery of of God in human carcasses. And that is a total mystery. I mean, it's a great mystery even to the day that, that God is in me. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not deserving of that. I've done this. I've done that. After all, I'm an old sinner. Bull. <laughs> I like to say the last part of that word. Because that's what it is. It's just waste. That, all that stuff that they told you was fodder's waste. Okay, verse 25. Joseph took up an oath of the children of Israel, saying unto them. Well, let me, I'm sorry, let me back up and finish reading verse 24 because I want you to get this really good. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land of unto the land which he sware unto Abraham. Okay, I want to put this on the board and I want you to look at this with me. I'm going to put our old faithful stick man right here. Let's see here. I'm getting sloppy with my circles, aren't I? <laughs> Okay, and uh, uh, Jamie was talking about the hair I had on his head. It was electrifying. So I put his hair back. <laughs> now you're talking about skeer. You understand the word skeer, don't you? Yeah. That's southern for being afraid. <laughs> skeer. Well, he or she's skeer. <laughs> Not really. He or she is standing in the position that you and I have been ordained to stand in. That's a crown. And it's not a crown of thorns. It's a crown of kingship, queenship, rulership. Because God has made you high priest of your house. And your house is your body. And God has made you the priest, the high priest and the king of your body. The queen of your body. And if you don't take authority over it, and if you don't uh, use that authority... It will take authority over you. It has, it does, and it continues to do so. And that's, that's to every one of us. I don't care who you are. Because it's not about trying to be perfect. I mean, if you keep trying to be perfect, you're just never going to get there. Depending on whatever your idea of perfection is. If you think you're never going to do this or that, if you think you're never going to turn to the right, you need to think you're going to... You know, if you, go to, if you go to the beach today, in this day and age, it's hard for a man to go down there and, and not pluck all his eyeballs out. I mean, dear God, women down there, they just butt, basically buck naked. And, and man is a lot more uh, visually sensitive than a woman is. A woman is 
her her way of love or her way of compassion is different than a man just looking. And saying, oh God, look at that! Hallelujah! <laughs> I am sinner. God help my sin. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Why? Because you know that's the motivation of the male species. That's the way God God made it. But when he comes to the place and he realizes he's the priest, high priest king over his house. You're the high priest king over your house. And if you can get this, if you will, you can get it. I'm going to show you what this is saying. The land that God swore to give them is this land. This land right here is the land of your physical body. It's not a geographical piece of property somewhere over in Asia Minor in the Middle East. That's ridiculous. He took, he took names and places, but what, that wasn't anything new exactly. That's exactly what the Egyptians did. They took names and places, rivers that run through, the, the Nile River that run through Egypt. They took the names of mountains. They took the names of towns. They took the names of characters. And they all were describing God's house, God's temple, which is your body. Even though they built the temple of Luxor, the temple of Luxor has been studied and researched and the temple of Luxor is built on the design of the human body from the feet to the top of the head. The whole temple is designed. I mean, every brick, everything laid out in it is laid out in it in, in specific ways so that it design, it's talking about the physical structure of the body. So, uh, I can't think of his name. Walter Lubitz. Uh, I can't, anyway, he has a book. Well, you can get quite a few of his books that he wrote called The Temple of God. And he spent, I think, 27 years in that temple, studying that temple, measuring that temple, taking every stone, everything he could get, measuring it. And, I mean, 27 years, and then he wrote a book called The Temple of Man. And it's all about the Temple of Luxor in Egypt. Then you come over to Israel and you got the same thing. It's just, it's just redone. It, it doesn't matter where you go. You could, even if you go down to Rome, Italy, when the Vatican, uh, when the Catholic Church took over the Vatican, it was already built. They didn't build that. It was built by a previous generation of people that were most likely Celtic because the Celtics covered that whole whole eastern sphere of Europe for all the way from Greenland, Iceland, Scotland, Ireland, all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea. Every bit of that was Celtic prior to the Catholic Church coming in there and taking over and then trying to destroy every religion on the face of the earth that they could. They went and burned books, tore down buildings, tire up tear up beautiful coliseums, tear up beautiful temples because they wanted to establish theirs and that's, that's God. If you didn't bow to theirs, they would kill you, burn you at the stake, tar and feather you, etc., etc. This is the land. Everybody just touch your body say, this is the land. This, this, is, this the is, land. is the land of God. Touch your body say, this is Canaan. This, this is Canaan. So you got, everybody thinks, well, well, Canaan land, my home in glory. In glory. Where's that at? <laughs> you just shut yourself. Right here's where the glory's at. Right here. Glory's right here. That's right. And your home is in glory. It's right here in your physical body. This is Canaan land. Right. And you don't understand. We don't understand this stuff. It says Canaan land is land that flows with hills and valleys. You ever been on a hill? Mm -hmm. Top of a mountain? Mm -hmm. Looks yeah. good? You ever been down in the valley? Yeah. Oh God, I'm down here. I mean, I'm over there. I can go make it. That's king of land. Well, then what in the world is king of land? Touch yourself. I am king of land. Amen. Your body is. And that's what the whole story is about. It's about the land that flows with milk and honey. What is the land that flows with milk and honey? King of land. Where is that at? It's your pineal gland that flows with an oil that's like milk. And your pituitary gland back here that flows with an oil that looks just like honey. Isn't that amazing? Yes. I, to, I mean, these, these stories, man. They knew what they were writing about. They knew what they were talking about. They understood these ancient mythologies and they put it together in such a beautiful way if you and I could just get an eye to see it, an ear to hear it, and get, and get out of that religious garden. So, no. Uh, oh, let's see here. This right here. How do you spell Abraham? Abraham. This represents everybody. Everybody say 
Just put your hands right here, right above your heart. And everybody say, from here up from here is the land of Abraham. This is Abraham. Alright, let's go to the next one right here. Because this is what it says in verse, verse 24. And Joseph said unto him, unto brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of the land unto the land which he swore unto Abraham, unto who? Isaac, Isaac and, Jacob. and unto Jacob. So, so if I if I break this down. Like this. Spirit, soul, and body. And if we go back and we we'll start to look at these characters, these names of these characters, you begin to realize that's what these characters represent. Mm -hmm. Spirit, soul, and body. So the spirit, soul, and the body are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is something that just unfolds all the time. And what these represent in the Hebrew glyphs is this one represents the Aleph. This one represents the Beth. And this one represents the Gimiel. And so by doing that, what happens is we have to learn to keep these first three glyphs, the Aleph, the Beth and the Yimiel. We have to learn to keep these three focused as to know that they are a reflection of who we are and what God did. And how did God do that? God as the number one, the only way He could ever manifest itself. And, and, and this is this is just in stone. You can't change this. People are wanting to go to a better place. Well, if you want to go to the better place, go out that door and come back in into this place. <laughs> Because it's the better place. I mean, it is. It's the better place. Why? Because you, as God, make it that way. That's right. If you, as God, don't make it that way, it's not that way. That's right. It is what you make it. It's what you what you manifest it to be. If you think it's hell on earth, then you'd be just like 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 her grandmother, dying screaming hard. Oh, my face burning! My face burning! It wasn't burning. That's what. What is that? That's psychological damage. Psycholog and I guarantee you there is not a person sitting here right now that hasn't been damaged psychologically. You know, just exactly like uh, Frida, uh, Frida said that word to me. I want to go to, into myself, in my, in my own privacy, and see, am I holding on to something, Father, that I need to turn loose and get rid of? God knows I've got plenty of opportunities to do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, really? <laughs> because people say things about, that ain't true. But that's what they think, and they think it's true. And I hope that I'm not holding some grudge or something there, but I'm going to go and search my own heart so that I can get free from that, so that I, I can, uh, whatever it is. So spirit, soul, and body, everybody's made up of this, this trinity of God. Everybody. God, only way God can materialize anywhere is it has to split itself up into two. It has to mirror itself. It has to project itself as positive and negative. There's nothing on this earth that can exist on this earth if there's not a positive and negative pole. If there's not a male and female atmosphere. It is the only way in any world whatsoever, whether it be the earth that we call the earth, Gaia, whatever you want to call this ball that we all live on, or probably billions more that are out there in the universe. If there are billions more out there, they're going to be like this one. They're going to manifest. Now, they may be manifested a little bit further progression or whatever, but, uh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, oof, oof, I'm trying to think of a book that I read, Greg Braden's book. It's called, uh, I think it's Designed by Intention. I think I'm not. It seems like that's the way it is, and he he as a ge, geologist and scientist did a lot of research, and they they found a uh, a little baby girl somewhere in the Netherlands, I believe is what he said. They found her. She was probably between either a, 
newborn and three to six months old, and she was a perfect specimen. And they estimated her. They did. They estimated her to be somewhere around thirty thousand years old. But now here's the thing about it: was they did a DNA sample on her. It's, it's still plenty of there to do that DNA sample. They did a DNA sample on her and come to find out that her DNA is not any different than your and my DNA. Simply to say, there's not anything in mankind and the way he is now that's different than the way he was 30,000 years ago. Then they found some bone structure somewhere in Iceland or in the ice that dates back over 200,000 years and they checked the DNA on that and it's exactly the same thing. So what does it say? It's simply saying man is the way man was created. So man has not evolved. It shocked Darwin's theory completely out of the water. Man has not evolved from a monkey or any other neothoral animal. Man is the way God made man. I tell you, it makes you unique and specific and that <laughs> turns me right on. <laughs> Ain't nothing changed. Now, is there evolution in creation? I would absolutely say yes. Do plants evolve? I really think that they do. I mean, you know, like I think insects evolve into higher forms of, of insect being. I, I mean, I couldn't prove that, but I believe biology could prove that very fact. But to say that we come from an animal, to say that we come from a monkey is ridiculous, and yet people won't believe that. And then say, oh, we're trying to get, I'm trying to get rid of my animal nature. You may have a nature that acts like an animal, but you don't have an animal nature. It tells you in 1 Peter, you have a divine nature. What you ought to do is get off your duff and get out there and find your divine nature and work on that. Begin to live by that. Begin to live by the, by the expression of what God called you. So the only way that God can manifest Himself is He has to split Himself off into a duality, male and female. That's why God is androgynous as God. But he mirrors himself. That gives it. That gives him the Beth. Beth is a container, a home. Everybody touch your body. Say, "This is the container." This is the container. And this is the home. This is the home that God lives in. So when God split Himself on, He moved into that. And then number three, God moved right back into it. It give me up to give you the ability to walk up right like any, nothing else on the face of the earth. God moved right back into it. How did He do that? The very moment you took that first breath. I mean, I, I just can't get that's better than fried chicken for what that is. <laughs> so he uses this pattern right here, and that pattern is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I, I wanted to read you some of the notes that I wrote about these characters because it just gets into so much. But let me just read you the notes I wrote about Abraham. Abraham, because Abraham comes from Abram. Matter of fact, I tell you what, let's do. Before I read them notes, you're right here in Genesis. Back over to Genesis chapter 11. I get to chasing rabbits right here. Close to my end and I will be in trouble. <laughs> These rabbits can go all kinds of places. Look at this. Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter uh, 11. And from Genesis, this chapter 11 is a, is a culmination of things that have been said, of course, from Genesis chapter 1 through to chapter 11. And what has been told in this is three different stories. From Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 11. And these three different stories, now y'all listen and get this. These three different stories have within them, every one of these three stories have within them Seven yom. That's the Hebrew word yod bim non. That's the that's the Hebrew word yom. And what it what it means is it means life, happy life, uh, uh, long life. Good life. Any any of anything that you can add to life that's positive. That's what that word yom means. And it's always it's always refers to seven of them. Why is it always referred to seven? It's referring to your physical body. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven 
major glands is what built your physical body in the womb of the mom. That's why you have so many sevens in Scripture. Seven colors of the rainbow. That's the second story. And that story was a Noahic story, right? And what was the end of that Noahic story? He said, I'm going to put a bow in the sky. Really? How many colors in the rainbow? Seven. Seven. How many colors on the scale? No remedy for so lot to you? No. Seven. How many colors on the golden candlestick? Seven. Seven. Why you got all that? Because it always referring to the seven facets of life of your physical body. Because your physical body is the land. Everything in this book talks about. It. It's not moving to another land thinking you're going to go over to that land. It's going to be much better. More gooder over there than it is here. You know, so, no, it ain't no better over there than it is here. It's better here if that's what you make it to be here. You're never going to move away to a better place. People always want to move. It's going to be better over there. No, it's not. It's going to be the same thing it is here. Just give it a few weeks, a few months, a few years, and you'll, you'll create the same thing. Same thing. It's not moving that makes any difference. Mercy. I'm not being too harsh today, am I? Nope. Uh, oh, good. So, here we go to the Genesis chapter 11. This is the third time that you will find the stories of seven told in three generations. In, in, in three generations that produce seven generations. And starting out with, uh, we're starting out with the Esh and Esha. Not Adam and Eve. Esh, the Esh and Esha. That should be how it starts out with. There is no Adam and Eve. Adam is referring to all of mankind. Eve is referring to the life that's in all of mankind. Okay, that's, Eve's only used twice. She, and she's only referring to the life that's in everything. Eve is in the trees. Eve is in the dogs. Eve is in the, Eve is in the horses. Eve is in all life. Anything got life on it, that's, that's what ha, Eva, that's what her name It means life. And she's in all that. So, when you come out of the story of Genesis 1, 2, and 3 into Genesis chapter 4, then you see there it says that Eesha, not Eesha, who, who is the manifest mother of life, she began to birth, and she had what? Three sons, and out of the third son, Shem, sorry, Seth? Yeah, Seth? Out of that third son set, you got seven generations. Out of that seven generation, you come to the story of Noah. Out of Noah, and Noah had how many? Three. Three sons. And out of, out of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jacob, Shem had, guess what? Seven generations. And you come out of that to right here when you get to Genesis chapter 11. If you look at verse 10, it says these are the generations of Shem. This is Noah's three boys. And this is the last one, which always represents the spirit. Set represents the spirit. Shem represents the spirit. Watch this. And then if you come down and out of this, out of verse 10 to verse 12, which is Acts for, at, at, uh, our facts add, then you come to verse 14 is Selah. Verse 10, 16 is Eber. Verse 18 is Peleg. Right on down to verse 24. Come with me to verse 24. And Nahor, that's his seventh son. You have seven I mean, this story right here is repeated over and over and over about the stick man, about the seven endocrine glands, about the number seven. And it's on purpose because the stories are repeating themselves. And I know what God did that because He knew how hard-headed I was. <laughs> he knew how hard it was for me to try to take something and accept it and be what, what it is. And so you come down to uh, verse 24. It says, And Nahar lived nine nine and twenty years and begat Terah and Nahar lived after that he begat Terah a hundred and nineteen years and be, he begat sons and daughters and Terah lived seventy years and begat, look at this Abram, Nahar and Haran. Wow! Three more boys! And out of these three boys you have the entire story that begins to unfold out of the first son which is called Abraham or Abram who represents the Spirit again. So all of these stories are reproduced by using seven sons or seven endocrine glands and all of them are reproduced by using the number three. Every one of them. The third uh, out, of three, out of three boys. So it says in verse 26, And Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram 
Nahor, and Haran. And then come down to uh, verse uh, 31. It says that Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur. Ur. That word Ur is the same word that's used in Genesis 1, uh, Genesis 1, 4. It says, and God is light. It's the word, Hebrew word for for light, L-I-G-H-T. So the land, the land of Ur is the land of light. It's the same word used as as light. And it says it went to the land of from Ur of the Chaldees to go to Everybody say to go into. Go into. Everybody say it again. Say go into. Go into. Go into where? Cain. Where? The land of Cain. Go into the land of Cain. Now here, let me read you. Uh, uh, land of Cain. Let me see. I can find it right here, real quick. You got Mark. Listen to what the land of Cain. This is this. This is a metaphysical dictionary. Just listen to what it says about the land of Cain. It says Canaan. Canaan is a, it's a low land. It's a land of reeds, R-E-E-D-S. So actually Canaan is the land of reed, R-E-E-D which is mentioned in uh, the book of Exodus where Moses crosses the reed sea. R-E-E-D. Crosses the reed sea, which is actually, or, uh, which is translated wrongly for the red sea. It wasn't red. It was green. Everybody said it was green. It was green. If, you look at it, if you look at it in the Hebrew, that's exactly what it says. Moses didn't cross a red sea. Mm -hmm. uh, it's ridiculous that they translate it that way. If you get a Moffat's translation, it'll tell you Moses went across the Reed Sea, which is referring to right here, your heart chakra. Mm -hmm. you, you come from your lower nature, your physical body, your, from your abdomen, your strength, mm -hmm. physically, up to your heart, and that heart is the Reed Sea. It's, it's green. It's actually this color right here. That's why it's called Reed, because it's it's green. It has so much, it has the green growing in it that the water looks green. So that's, that's so it's crossing. The place of your heart's where you work out everything. You work out your salvation. You work out your holiness. You work out everything you're afraid. You work that out in your heart. Everybody has to come to that place because this is the land. This is the land where you have to do that. So it says, let me read you this right here. In order to redeem the body, man must enter with his spiritual thoughts into his organism and teach it the saving truth. This is the symbol of the teachings of Joshua chapter 1 when Joshua says that now he's the deliverer. Joshua was the same story and the same character person as Jesus was. Same thing, same story. That's a matter of fact where they borrowed the story of Jesus. They just incorporated a lot of Hindu stuff and incorporated a lot of uh, uh, Buddhist stuff. Okay, I'm going I'm to wind down right I've got to quit. The land, I'm going to read you some more. The land of Canaan, too, represents the unlimited elemental forces of being in which man is placed and to which he gives character through trust in God as omnipotent spirit. To mystics, it is the name of the invisible substance that surrounds and interpenetrates all forms of which it is the mother. I have to read that to you a couple of times so you can just really get that into your gut and, and I'm going to close with this. Let me say it this way. Say it this way. Let me read you one other scripture right here. Now, notice what it says in verse 31 real quickly. And Terah took Abram's, his son, 
Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees in, to go into the land of Canaan, to go into it. Everybody say that again. Go into go into the land of Canaan. Go into yourself. Go into yourself is what he's saying. He's, he's saying you've got to go into yourself. Yeah. Now, you don't have to wait to a puddle of water other than the puddle of water you were in. You are a puddle of water. <laughs> Look at chapter 12, verse 1, and it said, And the Lord said unto Abram, Get out. Now that word get out, go into. Everybody say that. Say get out. Get out. Or you go into. What that is that in Hebrew? That's le'ekleon. Le'ekleon. It seems it simply means to get out of your carnal mind, this lower nature, and get into your higher mind. Get out of what the surroundings are trying to tell you that they are. Whatever it's cancer, I don't care what it is. You understand? I don't care. That means I don't care. <laughs> you, you, you just kind of compress these things, you know? Push them together. You say a whole lot more quicker. <laughs> I don't care what people think. Get out of this. <coughs> it feels bad. I know it does. It hurts. I know it does. But begin to pay attention. Begin to focus more on what God gave you and go into what God promised you. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's the story of all of the scriptures. And if we would really focus on that, uh, it would help us to become more victorious the way we want to be and the way we have been built and the way have been, we have been designed. So I'm going to stop right there. We'll pick up right here again next week because I want to talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and go right back into to Exodus and show you uh, <coughs> more of uh, the story with Moses.